You guys go ahead and have a seat. Uh, thanks for being here as usual. If you weren't here last week, we started our new summer series on the book of Psalms. And, you know, we said, uh, I'll do my best, we said that when it's plural, it's Psalms, when it's singular, it's Psalm, right? And so we're preaching through the book of Psalms, and last week we preached through Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, because those two Psalms are there to kind of give us guidelines or guardrails for the rest of the book. The book of Psalms is 150 chapters. It's the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. It has more references to Jesus than any other Old Testament book. And so it's a fascinating book. It's a timely book. It's one that we need to understand because it's there for us to actually pray through. That's what we said last week. That's what the word meditate in Psalm 1 means. It means to murmur. It means to talk. It means to pray. And so the Psalms are there for us to actually pray them. They are there for us to actually say them, to meditate on them, to murmur them, to pray God's words back to God. And then we said in Psalm 2, the, the whole point of all this meditation is to get to the Messiah, is to get to Jesus. Because if we're just praying something and just meditating on something, we're praying through something, we're not getting to something, we, we can clearly misunderstand the fact that the entire point of even the Old Testament was the coming Messiah. And so what you see in the New Testament revealed was hidden in the Old Testament. It was there. They were just looking forward to it. And then what you see in the New Testament is you see that revelation. You see that coming forward. And we showed last week how that refers to Jesus, the Messiah. So if you weren't here, as always, you can go back online, catch that up uh, just to get through it. Now, what we're going to do for the rest of the series is obviously there's no way we can preach through every chapter of the book of Psalms because 150 chapters, we've covered two already. So that would take us about three years to hit every chapter. But what you see in the book of Psalms, uh, and scholars you know, disagree on, on how many categories, but what you see in the book of Psalms is kind of some loosely grouped categories. Now, they're not organized necessarily that way in your Bible, like you know, this set is this category, this set is this category. But when you look at all 150 of them, what you can kind of, you know, decipher from it is there's different types of prayers. And so, you know, scholars, again, I said, you know, kind of debate about how many. But when you look through it, it's about seven or eight categories or so of different types of prayers that the nation of Israel prayed. And so what we're going to do over the next seven weeks, including this weekend, is we're going to take a psalm or a couple psalms from each one of those categories and preach through those so that you'll kind of get a feel for the entire book. Uh, and those categories are something like this, like a category of lament. That means when you are depressed or experiencing trouble or, uh, or pain, there's quite a few psalms in that category. There are psalms of confession. Uh, when, when someone sinned, they were confessing, they were praying that to God. There are wisdom psalms, which are psalms that, that are prayers, but, but they are psalms that teach us a lot of wisdom. There are uh, cursing psalms. There's a third of those that are this. This will be a category we'll get into later that's quite surprising that, that you could actually pray this way. Uh, there are royal psalms. Those are kind of messianic psalms. That's one of the ones we did last week. And then probably the largest category are what is called worship psalms. And we'll do those towards the end. So we're going to kind of pick from each one of those categories. And today, we're going to be in the lament category. And the primary reason for that is Psalm 3 through Psalm 7. So we did one and two last week. So the very next psalm is a lament psalm. Now, I'm not going to preach through Psalm chapter 3, not because it's bad, but in, in kind of those categories, one of the more famous psalms in the lament category is Psalm chapter 42. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 42. And when I originally started studying this, I was just going to preach on Psalm 42. And then I realized through study and looking at different commentaries and things like that, that Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 originally were one psalm. They were broken up into two for whatever reason. And so I'm going to do primarily Psalm chapter 42. It's the long one. And then at the end, I'll pull in part of Psalm 43 because those two actually go together to form one psalm. Because you know all the chapter divisions and verses in your Bible were not there originally. They came about 900 years after Jesus when some monks got together and organized it. So every chapter division is not necessarily divinely inspired. 
Because if you ever read the Bible, you're like, why in the world does this sentence not go to that chapter? And that's a valid question, because it normally is meant to flow together. And so we're going to look at Psalm chapter 42, Psalm chapter 43. And what you're going to see in this category of lament, you're going to see honesty. I think this is why this is probably one of the most heartfelt categories, because what you're going to experience is you're going to experience people having real struggles, having real problems, dealing with real issues, and they are praying through those. And so when I say the word lament, I want you to understand what I'm saying. So I gave you the definition of it. Here it is on the screen. This is what the word lament means. It means to feel, show, or express grief, sorrow, or regret to mourn deeply. Now these highly emotionally charged psalms record the writer's heart cry to God for divine deliverance from trouble and pain. So when I say that word lament, now you know what I mean, right? I mean, it's not a really happy word to begin with, right? But what it means is it's, it's mourning, it's grieving. And if there's one thing I've learned kind of just, you know, 37 years in American culture is we don't know how to grieve very well. We really don't know how to grieve very well because we kind of live in this shallow society that's, that's always looking for the next thrill, the next, I mean, we love to be entertained as Americans. I mean, that's why they do summer blockbuster movies and stuff, and again, ain't got nothing wrong with that, but we just love entertainment. We love amusement, right? We even build parks dedicated to amusement, right? We call them amusement parks. I was, I was, I know that was tough tough for you, all right? Yes, we call those amusement parks. And you know the word muse means to think. And when you put the A prefix in front of it, it means the opposite of it. So amuse means not to think. So we have entire parks dedicated to not thinking. Unless you go to Disney World and you better have a PhD to know how to figure out that park, right? to get all the fast passes and where you're going, all that kind of stuff. And so it's kind of an amusement park gone awry. But the point of it is, in this culture, we really don't know how to grieve. We, we really don't know how to take time to grieve. We don't really know how to create space to grieve. We don't even know how to, to speak about grieving. To where when you were growing up in a Hebrew culture, when, when something bad happened, you would go into a period of mourning. You would put on sackcloth and ashes, and, and you would take weeks and weeks, and you wouldn't shower, and you wouldn't bathe, and, and you would mourn, and you would grieve, and then you would go through that period, and you would work your way out of it. And so here in our kind of Western context, these kind of Psalms can be really helpful because they show us how the Hebrews grieved but how they prayed through that grief. And so what you're gonna see in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 is you're gonna see a pattern. You know, most of the Psalms are poetry. They are written as poems. And, and when you're writing poems, right, if you remember back to seventh grade English, there's rhythm to it, there's rhyme. A lot of times there's, it's laid out in a certain way. And you're going to see that in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. That's why most scholars think that they were together is because these two psalms have three parts and each part ends with the same phrasing. And so you got one section, the same phrase, one section, the same phrase, one section, the same phrase. So you're going to see this kind of repeated and you're going to see this pattern and I love it and I did my best to try to deduce this pattern. And so you're going to see honesty. I mean, like real honesty, like gut level honesty. Then you're going to see some remembrance, kind of remembering back. Then you're going to see hope. Then you're going to see more honesty. Then you're going to see hope. Then you're going to see honest asking. Then you're going to see hope. And so that's kind of this pattern that flows throughout Psalm 42 and 43. So let's jump in. I'll show you what I mean. Psalm 42, verse 1 through 3 says this. As a deer... Pants for flowing stream, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Now, here's the first honest question When shall I come and appear before God? 
My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? So first off, you see this gut level, honestly, uh, we don't know exactly who wrote it, just says the sons of Korah. Uh, so that could have been a person, this is his sons, or could have been a group of people or a certain type of people. But regardless, what you see is you see this kind of emotionally charged prayer, saying, saying God, my soul longs for you. And when you long for something or pant for something, it means you don't have it at the current moment. And, and so he's expressing this, this concept of, of like, God, where are you? Where are you? When can I come and see your face again? When can I appear before God? And when it says that, it's talking about face to face. And so what happens is this guy or this group of people feel like God has turned his back on them. And they're no longer seeing God's face. Have you ever felt like that? You ever felt like there was this distance between you and God? And, and one of the things that I don't like about kind of what I would call cheesy Christianity, like I was told this probably a hundred times, it's popular at uh, like student camps growing up kind of thing, and preachers would say, well, if you feel distant from God, guess who moved? Like I can't stand that phrase. Because what that phrase implies is it's my fault that there's a distance. Now, that's true half the time. When there's a distance between me and God, sometimes it is my fault. And we'll get into that when we get into the Psalm of Confession, right? So, sometimes it was straight up my fault because I sinned, I disobeyed, and so God was still there, but I chose to turn around. I chose to go the other direction. I chose to turn my back on God. I willfully chose that. And so there, there's a distance created. But there are other times when my face is is directed towards God, I'm looking at God, I'm worshiping God, and I feel like he turned his back on me. I was doing everything right. And yet something terrible still happens. Someone still dies, you still lose a job. Those people still talk bad about you. And, and so the reason why I hate that shallow statement is sometimes it wasn't me who moved, it was God. Straight up. Sometimes you're doing everything right and you feel so close to God and then all of a sudden something happens and there's a distance created, but it wasn't you who moved, it was God. Now, when God moves like that, obviously he's not moving in disobedience because he can't. He's not even moving in sin because he can't. But, but a lot of times that distance that is created is the distance when something sinful happens, but it wasn't of God's doing. But because it happened, and because God could have stopped it, and he didn't, there's this distance. Like, like God kind of moves in a way, like Isaiah says, his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so you take the story of Job, like straight up, no one likes the story of Job. No one. And most scholars believe Job is the oldest book in the Bible, written before the Pentateuch, the first five that Moses wrote. And so it's the oldest book that we have, <laughs> and it's the one book nobody likes. Why? Because Job was doing everything right. In fact, Satan comes to Job, or Satan comes to God and says, hey God, look at Job, your servant. He's doing it all right. But then Satan makes an accusation. He says, but he's doing it all right because you're blessing him. You take that blessing away and he'll curse you. And God says, okay, try. And so God allows Satan to take the blessing away. Now, it wasn't God doing it. But, but there's those moments in our lives where we feel tangibly God blessing us, and then there's moments when we don't. We don't feel like he's blessing us, and we cry out, God, where are you? That's why this psalm is here, and many more like it, to help us pray through this. Because the worst thing that we can do in our grief is not talk to God. That's the worst thing we could do. 
If you look throughout the book of Job, Job prays to God. In fact, in Job chapter one, Job's wife tells him, curse God and die. And Job, showing how godly he is, says, woman, you're talking like a crazy woman. It's my translation, but it's, a, it's right there. He's like, you're talking crazy. No. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And I'm gonna praise him, whichever he's doing. And then you see, for like 38 chapters, Job in a cave with pottery, scape, scraping his skin, lamenting, grieving. So here's, here's my point. I think as Christians, when we have those tangible times when we feel like God is not blessing, what we're going to have to learn how to do is not curse God, but pray through this to God. And the first thing I want you to see is it's okay to be honest. It is okay to be honest with him. Can I just tell you that God hates false piety? He does not like it. You know how we know this? Because when Jesus showed up on the scene, a couple thousand years after this, you wanna know what Jesus railed against more than anything else? The false piety of the religious leaders. The ones who were acting all religious, but they were doing it out of self-righteousness. They were doing it saying, look at how righteous I am. And Jesus rails against that. He can't stand it. And that makes me love Jesus because I can't stand it either. I can't stand it in the moment of sheer grief when someone walks in and says, God's gonna use this for good. Really? Because I wanna punch your face right now. <laughs> I wanna punch you. Because this is not good. And that's great. I believe God's gonna use it for good. But right now, I don't need that. I need you to cry with me. I need you to ask honest questions with me. I just need you to say, I don't know, but I'm here. See, as Christians, we struggle with being honest. And isn't that funny? Shouldn't honesty kind of be like the hallmark of Christianity? But we only know to be honest when God's blessing us. Well, yeah, of course God would bless me. Look at how obedient I am. I don't know why I do this anytime like that. That means self-righteousness. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> like we've got cause and effect for that. You know what I'm saying? Like he blessed me because I'm obedient. But when he's not blessing, we don't have cause and effect for that. Can I just tell you, when he blesses, it's not necessarily because you're obedient. And when he's not blessing, it's not necessarily because you're disobedient. Now, I don't know why. His ways are higher. But here's what I can say to you. Be honest. Ask God honest questions. Your heavenly Father is not unable to handle your honesty. He's just not. It's okay. And so what you see first in this psalm is honest. When shall I come before God? Then he says, my tears have been my food my day, uh, day and night. When they say to me, we don't know if he's referring to his tears talking to him or his enemies because he's about to talk about his enemies. He says, man, this is how I feel. I feel like God has left me. And I feel like everybody, even my tears, is saying, where is your God? And a better translation of that phrase, where is your God, is what is your God doing? What is your God doing? See, when we talk about an all-loving, omniscient God, and then evil in the world happens, what does the world say? I thought you said your God was loving. What was he doing? What was he doing when that happened? What was he doing? And kind of in those moments of just raw, gut-level honesty, I think that that's an opportunity for us to be like, you know, I don't know. I'm struggling too. 
But, but the hard part in that is when we're wrestling through that honesty, if, if we don't remain honest, then we'll kind of go to places that we should never go. Like, well, there is no God. And, and friends, I gotta tell you, I have done some horrific funerals. The very first funeral I ever did when I was 19 years old was for my 17-year-old cousin, my first cousin, my mom's sister's son. They lived with us. I grew up with him. First funeral I ever did. I've done a funeral for a 14-month-old baby, drowned in a pool. And these honest questions of where is God are honest, and they're okay. But, but if we don't learn how to ask them, then we'll come to, to false conclusions like, well, there is no God. Because if there was a God, he wouldn't let this happen. And one of the things I always say in those moments is, listen, if you think that, if you think there is no God, then what that means is this act is all the more random. And it means that there is no God who can use this for good. It just means a 14-month-old died. If there's no God, then there's no hope. And so there's this balance of like, and you're going to see it in the psalm, of honesty and hope. Honesty, ask honest questions, yet remain hopeful. Look at where he goes. Verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng, that means a group of people, and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. So check this out. These people or this person used to be the worship leader. He said, I would lead them in procession to the house of God. So he was a leader in the house of God. And now, for whatever reason, something's happened, and he's learning how to be honest with God. And I want you to see this connection. Our worship of God, a lot of times, is very shallow until we learn how to grieve. Because it's easy to come in with the multitude and praise when God's blessing, right? It's easy. Yeah, praise God. I got a raise. Praise God. My wife likes me. Praise God. But when you've come in and literally the hell's been beaten out of you, you don't feel like praising, do you? You don't feel like it. And I think what is so striking about this part of the lament is he's not saying that he's praising God for the grief. He's remembering of when he did praise God. So the second pattern in this is you kind of move from honesty to remembrance. And here's why. Because your grief has to be bookended. Your grief has to be grounded. If your grief doesn't get grounded, if it just floats out there, it will destroy you. But if you ground it, and you can ground it in your remembrance of worshiping God, and he's going to say in just a second, he will praise God. That's in the future. So what he's saying is, I'm not praising God right now, but I remember I did, and I will. So that bookends his grief. And what that does for you is it grounds you still in the goodness of God. And this is why coming to corporate or or communal gathering times where we worship God are so important. You know why? He says it. He calls it a multitude of keeping festivals. Or this multitude at this keeping festival. This keeping festival literally means these festivals that he kept. He had a regular routine of going to the house of God. 
He had a regular routine in his life of going to the house of God. And since he had that, when the grief came, that kept him. You catch that? See, the worship of God that he kept as a regular schedule, now when he's not worshiping God, it's keeping him. It's holding him. My friends, can I say it to you like this? Grief is going to happen to you. It's not if, it's when. And if you don't have a regular routine of worship, you won't have anywhere to ground your grief. You won't have anywhere to ground it. You will be undone. And I've already said it's okay to be honest. But the routine of worship is what grounds you. Now, now listen, I like online. We have online. How All you in Florida, good to see you. Glad the hurricane's through, all right? But I like online. It's, it's good. We got it. It's a tool. But nothing replaces being with people. Nothing replaces sitting side by side with a flesh and blood human. Nothing replaces small groups. Nothing replaces the church of God coming together to worship God. Because a lot of times you need to remember this worship, but you can't, but those close to you can help remind you. See, we've got to have this regular routine of worship. We've got to keep that. And again, I'm not talking legalistic. I'm not saying come to church every Sunday with your Sunday best and your Bible toting, you know, big bag, Christian stickers. I'm not saying that. I'm just talking about what's the rhythm of your worship. Not how much rhythm do you have in worship. Like, no, I'm talking about what is the rhythm of your worship. Not even here, because what happens here is meant to continue throughout the week. That's why we play some of the songs that we play, so that you can listen to them. They're contemporary. You can get them on iTunes. You, you can kind of develop this rhythm in your week of worship, because what worship does, and there's another song that references this, is it lifts up your eyes. It lifts up your eyes beyond what you can see, because when you're grieving, all you can see is grief. All you can see is pain. All you can see is sorrow. But if you don't have depth, then you'll never have height. You'll never be able to look up because you're not grounded. So he remembers, which then leads him to the next section, which is hope. Look at this. Psalm 42, 5 and 6. Now he's talking to himself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Hope in God. Now listen to this. For I shall again praise him. I shall. My salvation and my God. My soul is cast down. You hear the honesty? Oh, my soul's cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. You know what he's saying? My tears are going to fall onto some ground. I just want them to fall into God's ground. Because if they can fall into God's ground, that's why he talks about the land of the Jordan. That was the land of God's victory. That was the land of the conquest. They crossed the Jordan. He says, right now, I can't praise. But I did and I will. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm looking up. I will praise him. That's why I'm commanding myself hope in God. You know this phrase? It's amazing. It's written in the imperative, which I tell you this often. That's the command tense of the Bible. But the psalmist isn't commanding someone else to hope in God. He's commanding himself. Do you talk to yourself like this? This is actually very healthy. Psychologists call it self-talk. Self-talk doesn't mean you're crazy. But what you tell yourself will make you crazy. 
You with me on that? What you tell yourself will make you crazy. If you tell yourself, it'll never get better. If you tell yourself, God hates me. If you tell yourself, this is what he always does. You'll go crazy. And see, it's in those moments we need psalms like this that teach us how to pray our grief. And what he's teaching us is this, even though you don't feel like it, command it anyway. Command it anyway. Right? This is what I try to teach my kids. When I ask them to do something, I don't feel like it. I didn't ask you how you felt. That wasn't a suggestion. That's my phrase. My, that wasn't a suggestion, homie. It was a command. Why? There's something amazing about commands. Very rarely do we feel like doing them. But after we've done them, we're glad we did them. It's like working out, right? Like, you may be one of that 2% of the population that just wakes up to work out, and we all hate you. <laughs> but it's okay. God loves you. We just don't. Because the rest of us wake up thinking, I don't want to do that. But what do you tell yourself? Do it. Why? Because when it's done, you'll be glad you did it. See, the psalmist is commanding. This word hope means to look forward. Means to look forward with. He's saying look forward with God. This is not the end. God is still in control, so therefore you have hope. And I'll show you why even more in a second. Now let's go to the next section. Verse 7. He's going to go back to an honest section. He's going to go back to an honest section. You're going to see this hope and honesty intermingled with each other. He says, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Now, again, any, anytime you're trying to interpret what the Bible is saying, it only has one meaning, but the interpretations can be plenty. And this psalm, a lot of times, gets interpreted like, oh, deep calls the deep. I'm in the roar of your waterfalls. God's love is just crashing over me. And, and that's okay to think that. But almost all scholars agree that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. I'm going from chaos to chaos. Deep to deep. Not deep in, in the love of God, but deep into darkness. Because this word deep means abyss. Abyss calls to abyss. Darkness calls to darkness. Why? Because darkness loves darkness. John 1 says, the light came, but the people rejected it. Why? Because they love darkness. Because darkness is the absence of light. So what I think he's saying here is it's not some kind of waxing poetic, I'm just feeling the love. It is, God, you keep freaking hitting me with waves of sorrow. Wave after a wave. I feel like are breaking over me. It's just like one wave of sorrow. Then I get my head up, another wave of sorrow. Then I get my head up, another wave of sorrow. How's that for honesty? How about them apples, right? Hey, God, I feel like uh, you just keep breaking me with your waves. Sorrow after sorrow. Honest. But hear the hope. Verse 8, he said, and it almost is like there should be a yet there. Yet, by day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me. What is he saying? He's saying that even though God is allowing, he's not causing, he's allowing the waves of sorrow to crash him, God commands his steadfast love in the wave. Why? Because a lot of times we can't understand the dimensions of love 
until there are waves of sorrow. Again, this was Satan's accusation against Job. Of course he loves you, God. Look at him. He's the most blessed man on earth. Everything has gone good for him. Of course he loves you. But you crash waves over him and he'll curse you. And so God allows the waves to come. But you get to the end of the book and God says that Job never cursed him. Why? Because when God allowed the waves, he also, I want you to see this, commands his love. Commands it. And so, whatever God allows to come to you, he will command his love to come through you. Whatever is coming, he'll give you what you need. And so you see this honesty, and you see this hope that even though I'm in this wave, God's love's with me. Why? Because he commands it. And when God commands something, it happens. All he has to do is speak it. We talked about that last week. He said, his song is with me at night. So during the day, I'm sustained by his love. At night, I'm sustained by his song. He's singing over me as I'm praying to him. Now you see another honest section. Verse nine and 10. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones. That just shows you how deep he feels this. He feels it in his bones as if someone had pierced him and he was about to die. My adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Again, repeats the phrase again. What is your God doing? And if that's all we had, we would learn how to pray our grief, but we wouldn't learn how to hope in it. But thankfully, he doesn't leave us there. Look at verse 11. This is the phrase that repeats three times in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Again, he speaks to himself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Again, it's a command. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. These two phrases I love, my salvation and my God. My salvation means what he has done for me. My God is who he is for me. See, what he's grounding himself in is what God has done and who God is. He has saved my soul because he is my God. So I'm gonna hope in him. I'm gonna command myself. Now, switch over to Psalm 43. <clears throat> so far we've seen honest, remembrance, hope, honest, hope, now you're gonna see the next step of the pattern. Because if we just kind of stayed in that pattern, we'd be like Top Gun, just circling the tower, right? Negative Ghost Rider, pattern's full. you just be circling. Honest hope, honest hope. And this is why I think it's important to put these together. What he's gonna do in Psalm 43 is he's gonna ask. Now he asks. Amazingly, when we think of prayer, we think of asking, don't we? But he's gone through 11 stanzas before he ever asked for God to do something for him. Not asking an honest question, but asking God to do something. Now this is important because once you've gone through your honesty, once you've gotten hope, then it gets you to the point of saying, God, I'm gonna ask you to do for me what you promised to do. Now listen to his question, Psalm 43, three through five. He says, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my God. See, he had this grounding in worship. He had this hope of saying, I will praise him again, said it twice. 
But notice the connection. He is fully aware that the only way he'll get out of this grief, out of this abyss of darkness, is if God leads him. If God leads him out. See, where a lot of us get stuck in grief is we quit asking God to lead us out. We just ask him to take it away. Take this from me. And, and sometimes, I don't know why, he doesn't. But when we ask God to lead us out, that is a prayer he can and will answer. It may not happen when we want, but he can lead us out. And notice the specificity of his question. Send out your light. What do you need in darkness? What? Light. Send out. Notice, he has been honest, God, it's dark down here, man. I need you to send out your light. Send it forth. This, this phrase, light, I love it. It means daylight, dawn, contrasted to night. When you feel like it's pitch black, you know what the hope of God is? Dawn's coming. Light is coming. Because that's how God set the world up. So ask for it. And then he says, send out your truth. You know what that means? It means the reality of God. See, the psalmist has been honest about his reality. Now he's asking for God's reality. God, send out your truth. Send out your light and let them lead me. Do you know what you need to get out of grief and lament and sorrow? You need light. You need light in the darkness. Okay, I can see now. And then you need truth. Truth is the way out. So you need light and you need truth. And he says, let them lead me. And where are they going to lead me? They're going to lead me back to the house of God. And I'm going to praise God. See, when we get to this point of honesty, raw grief, it's okay to pray how you're really feeling. But what the Psalms teach us is don't stay there. Ask God to lead you out. Ask God to send you light and truth to lead you out, and he will. And then he says the last stanza again. It's the one that repeated twice. Now he's going to do it a third time. Verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Psalm ends. So you see this pattern. Hope, remembrance, I mean, honesty, sorry. Honesty, remembrance, hope, honesty, hope, asking, hope. And the best way in our grief is to pray through that pattern, to pray through that. But the last element, remember I told you last week, Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 1 was meditate, so that's, that's this, Meditate on these psalms. Murmur these psalms. Pray through these psalms. But then Psalm 2 is Messiah. Understand that every grief that you're going through, Jesus himself went through. And the reason why you can have hope, I told you earlier, I would help you understand why we can have hope, is because, do you realize on the cross, when Jesus, before he breathed his last breath, Remember that phrase, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you to realize Jesus was quoting Psalm 22, verse one, which is a psalm of lament. It's a psalm of sorrow. And Jesus shows us the pattern 
in his moment of greatest grief, he's praying through his pain. He's praying literally Psalm 22, a psalm of lament. Why? Because even Jesus was grounding his grief in the word of God. And the hope of it is that your Friday pain will turn into a Sunday deliverance. See, not only did Jesus model for us the pattern, but he gave to us the hope. Because if God did it for Jesus, he'll do it for you. That's the message. So my final point, really my only point, when lamenting, pray through and pray to. Pray through this pattern and pray to your Messiah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness, for your grace, and I, and I thank you for psalms like these, that while sometimes they may not necessarily be the funnest to preach because of just the raw honesty, I thank you for them. Because if there's one thing that connects all humans together, it is suffering. It is grief, it is sorrow. But thank you that Jesus not only showed us how to pray through this pattern, but Jesus showed us that one day he will reverse the curse. That only in Christ can mourning be turned into praising. Because our hope is grounded in the fact that though we die, yet shall we live. And there is no other faith whose founder came back to life, not only proving that he was God, but giving hope to all humanity. So the only way through grief, God, is to know that we have hope. And our hope is in God, who is Christ. So I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that may be struggling with grief and sorrow. I pray that this patterns of Psalms will teach them how to pray, how to be honest, how to remember, how to have hope, how to be honest, how to have hope, how to ask, how to have hope. Teach us how to pray like this. And then more than anything, God, would you lead us out and lead us in to grace? And so, Father, I pray for anybody here today that doesn't know you, that doesn't have this hope, that can't stand in the midst of grief and say, I trust in God because they've never trusted you. No one looking around or talking here as we close, but if you've never prayed and trusted Christ, if you've never worshiped Christ, if you've never, and I don't mean worship by saying, I'm saying like you gave your life to him and you worship him. If you've never done that now, then you'll have nothing to go back to when your grief comes. So I want to settle that for you today. If you've never trusted him, if you want to be saved, I'm going to ask you to pray with me to yourself, not out loud. And it goes like this, say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. I trust you. I ask you to forgive me. Thank you for dying for my sins. I hope in you. No one looking around or talking again, but if you just prayed that with me for the first time, then I want to celebrate with you. We want to know about that. So right there where you are, would you just lift your hand? Just lift it up, even in the balcony. Lift it up. Thank you. Lift it up. Leave it up until one of our response team people walks around and puts a gift in your hand. And we're going to give you this gift because we want to be able to follow up with you, make sure you have the resources. So leave your hand up until they put it in your hand. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, those of us who, we'd say, yeah, I trust God, but I'm just grieving, man. I'm just in the midst of this wave after wave of sorrow. I hope today that these Psalms encourage you, but pray them, meditate on them, write them down, memorize them. And if you're not going through grief, do the same thing. Because it's not if, it's when. And when you go through it, you will need this. You will need to remember this worship moment. Father, we ask all this in your name. Amen.